Okay. Uh, well, today we're going to do uh, general rhythmogenic pathologies. Uh, there's six cases I want to run through. Um, I, I suppose these are kind of no misdiagnoses. Um, we'll, we'll focus on the EKGs that go along with them. Some of them, I will admit, are a little mean because there's not really pathognomonic findings, but are still good prompts for us to discuss stuff that you guys can see. Um, some of these um, I had never heard of uh, until medical school. Um, one was actually I learned about it was a VA patient, uh, and the another one, uh, an ER resident told me that he didn't find such and such on his EKG, and uh, being a little pompous in myself, I was like, ah, he's just making up acronyms, and then I Googled it, and then I thought to myself, well, thank goodness he was looking for it, because I didn't even know this existed. Um, and so, uh, just on that note, you can learn something from everybody. So always uh, be humble and recognize through the day. So, um, <laughs> so we will jump right in. Um, I forget why I, I did this for uh, family medicine. I am too poor to have any disclosures. So, um, so today we're going to review some common congenital pathologies, uh, particularly the, the EKGs that go along with them. Um, I've split this into three structural and three uh, conduction uh, diseases. Um, we're going to briefly touch on the pathophys and the causes of these diseases, um, diagnostic workup, um, and kind of what to include when you're, when you're uh, asking uh, for somebody to consult uh, on these patients, and then general management plans uh, to hopefully increase some comfort for you um, when you see these patients back in your uh, office and kind of understand it. Did every box get checked, or, or why was a box not checked? So, um, almost all of these really benefit greatly uh, when we catch them early. Um, and a lot of these are fall under the umbrella of you know what you know, you know, and you don't know what you don't know. So that's why I wanted to just uh, expose you all to, to them. Um, some of them truly are just incidental findings. You happen to do an EKG for some other reason, and then you catch this. Um, and, and that's the big uh, you know, point about knowledge is power, is, is knowing these little subtleties can really help your patients uh, get plugged into the right people early. Um, and uh, you know, the catastrophic consequences, as you could probably guess, some of these can lead to things like VT, VF. If that happens out and about, and they don't have a device, and they don't, you know, they're not next to somebody who knows CPR, that would fall into the, the category of you know, catastrophic. So. Um, so with that, we'll jump in. Um, this is just to remind you all, I'm going to quickly read through this. Uh, we all did uh, basic EKGs last week, but this is there's nothing to be frightened about. This is a normal EKG. We've got a normal axis with a positive vector in our QRS here in 1, positive in leap 2. If you do 1 in ABF, that's also positive, so this is a normal axis. Uh, we have a nice regular rhythm here with an upright P wave in lead two before every QRS, so this is sinus rhythm. Um, its rate is 300, 150, 175, about 63, 65 beats a minute. Um, our PR interval is less than one big box, so we don't have a first three AV block. There's a P for every QRS, so we don't have any dropped beats. QRS is narrow, so we don't have a bundle branch block. Our QT is about 380 to 400, um, and assuredly less than uh, half the RR interval, which is, um, for normal rates, a good gestalt. But um, as Dr. Bishop brought up last week, always measure your QTs. At slow and fast intervals, it can throw you off, and you can actually miss uh, prolonged or short, T, short QT uh, intervals. Um, our R wave progression is normal. Um, we've got a little ditzel here. You should always have an R wave by V2. It gets tallest in voltage probably by V5, V4, which is normal over the large mass of the uh, left ventricle uh, anterior wall, anterior lateral wall. Um, and no real signs of ischemia. Um, we are allowed a T-wave inversion in AVR because it is effectively the mirror version of lead 2. That's why our P-wave is inverted, our QRS is inverted, and our T-wave is inverted. So you're always allowed this. Um, and you are also allowed a T-wave inversion in V1. Um, sometimes it's biphasic, sometimes it's you know, inverted, but if it's an isolated T-wave inversion, that is, its contiguous lead of V2 does not also have signs of ischemia, this does not bother us. So overall, normal-looking EKG, lovely.
So our first section is going to be structural diseases. I'm going to give you an ECG. I'm going to go around the room. I'll have you all um, read it out for me. I do want you to read the entirety of the EKG like I just did. Um, and then give me your best gestalt of what you think um, this congenital uh, disease that can cause arrhythmia uh, would be. So this is a 37-year-old male presents to your office just to establish care. Um, he has dyspnea on exertion, and approximately one year ago, he said that he nearly passed out. Uh, his past medical history is pertinent for some hypertension. Family history is uh, negative for cardiopulmonary disease, but he did state that his maternal uncle died at 28 of an unknown cause. Um, vital signs are unremarkable outside of um, you know, that, that hypertensive uh, read there, 138 over 82. Social history is pertinent for a half pack today smoking for uh, 20 years. Um, just because I know that sometimes there are uh, electronically logged in folks uh, have to steal away. Uh, Ryan, do you mind uh, taking a stab at this EKG for me? I knew you would call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, get it over with. You can set the stage, you know, impress us. <laughs> All right, so uh, first things first, the rate is one, two, three, it's about 60 beats per minute. Um, it, it is regular. There is a P wave before every QRS that I see. Um, looking at the morphology, the first thing that sense, stands out is there is a bundle branch block or a widened QRS. So let's see, that would be a... That is a right bundle branch block. Good. And just trying to look for a V2, what I don't really know what it is. After the QRS, there is an extra um, dip there going into the T wave or before it even gets the T wave. Uh, are you talking about this? Uh, yes, that. Yep, the Ditzel. A Ditzel. Everybody knows <laughs> Ditzel is a, a accepted vernacular in cardiology. You say Ditzel over the phone on a console, uh, we will know what you're talking about. It's something so. different than when you say it to a radiologist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> different when said to a radiologist. Yes. Um, this is I probably don't... histoplasmosis uh, in the Ohio River Valley to them. No. <laughs> And the AVR is upright. Good. I'm trying to think of other pertinent things. What are the things that you're looking for so for me access, to read? Tell me, you, you kind of started your axis. Walk us through that. Oh my ad. Oh god. Um, I know. I'm sorry. It's been it's been a while. Diabetes has been on my mind for the past three, four weeks. Um, they get heart disease too. That's no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so upright in one. Good. Get it down in two. Good. And down in AVF. So my access would be right. Uh, it's not quite right yet, is it? Uh, it, it would be the antithesis of right. Left. Left, good. So, it, so when you're looking at your um, your positivity or your negativity, just try to remember where 1 and ABL are pointing, and that's over to your left shoulder, um, so that's going to swing it to the left. Um, but I, I agree, I look at 1 and 2 in ABF as well. So that's axis, you told me rhythm. Um, you told me the QRS was wide. What are the other intervals? Does the PR look normal? QT interval? Uh, the PR looks a little bit wide. So, well, if I go start at the P, it looks like a whole box. So it's probably a first degree block. I would agree. It's all the same. Uh, we don't see any, uh, you know, ratioed conduction like you would see in like a Mobitz 2. Um, there is a P before every QRS, but we don't see any non-conducted Ps. Uh, so good. So we've got a first grade AD block. We've got a right bundle branch block. Um, and uh, QT, signs of ischemia. Well, the only thing is the upright AVR, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's ischemia. No, and, and in fact, the, the T wave is still inverted, which is fine. It's just a mirrored version of, of two. So AVR doesn't really bother me too much. So I don't think I see anything. Okay. Um, we have early R wave progression just because the right bundle, that's 
perfectly diagnosed. Our terminal deflection in V1 is positive, which means it's going towards V1, towards the right side. This is also the classic R, S, R prime, um, or as everybody loves to colloquially call it, the bunny ears. Um, and for everybody who was there last uh, lecture, we look at V6 to confirm that, and our terminal deflection is appropriately opposite because we're looking at the same bundle bridge block from two different angles. Um, does this T wave look normal to you? No. Is this one? Ooh. No. There's your answer. <laughs> Bam. So, so V3 through V6 don't really look normal, and those are over anterolateral aspects of the LB. Um, and you know, we, we talked about physiologic uh, discordance in bundle branch blocks where the T wave looks abnormal because our, our conduction is abnormal, but these are particularly odd looking. Uh, we would normally expect this to just be a normal upright T wave because of my right bundle and would expect this to be negative, but these just don't look right. Um, and his history Shortness of breath, uh, you know, for a year in somebody who's got a pertinent family history. I told you his uncle died at 28 of an unknown cause. Um, mm -hmm. The general pathology you're thinking this patient is presenting you with is what? Not even necessarily uh, the diagnosis that you just saw, but the general umbrella term is he's coming to you with what? Um, somewhat. So sh like shortness of breath, he's got some abnormalities on his EKG, um, he's got hypertension, he could have heart failure, just in general. Oh. That, would, that would be on your differential. Mm -hmm. um, but if young people are dying uh, unknown, he has a familial um, you know, history of what could possibly be sudden cardiac death. And the most common cause of sudden cardiac death um, is, is what, especially in children? Hocum. Okay. Hocum, okay. good. So he has hokum. Um, great read overall. Thank you so much for taking us off the bat. Aria was so painful. Yeah, so um, just so for some more subtleties, if you are if your voltage is over 10 millivolts in the axial leads, that qualifies for LVH. If you are over 20 in the precordial leads, that also fits. Now there's multiple calculators that some are, you know, adding the S wave of V2, the R wave of V5, but if any R wave hits 20 millivolts, which is four big boxes high, you're thinking they probably have LVH. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, this person, V1 and V2 are over what, um, what segment of the heart? Septically. And, and people with hokum get, you know, we worry about SAM and septal hypertrophy, so that's telling us that there's higher muscle uh, mass in that area. Are these cubase abnormal in one ADL, or are they just a reflection of how big they are? This is this is just our right bundle. So, and, and again, you probably can't really fit a Q wave in there, and he's yeah. only 37, which means he's probably not had an MI. No. Um, uh, but good. And additionally, he has a left anterior fascicular block, which is when two, three, and ABF all have negative vectors. And remember, that's a you have to have all three. Um, so you can't just have two. So this is not a this is not a healthy looking conductive system. We've got a first grade AV block, a left anterior fascicular block, a right bundle branch block. We've got ischemic T waves, LVH. This is not what a thirty seven year old should look like, especially one with a familial history of of sudden cardiac death. And I would like you to think about the stem of that even before you saw the EKG. My hope is you would be able to answer the question right if it were boards, right? Obviously, the EKG is a clue because sometimes you don't have this history, but on an exam, like you should probably almost always be able to answer the question based on this stim, and then the EKG is bonus points if you're able to come So, 1 in 500 have um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, not necessarily obstructive. Uh, so, it is not a, a rare disease. This is something that you will all see at some point in your careers. Um, it is the leading cause of sudden cardiac death in children and young adults younger than 30. Um, and it is autosomal dominant, typically with a variable uh, penetrance. Um, and um, I believe there's a number of genes that can lead to this, but beta myosin heavy chain um, or the MVPC3 gene is the predominant uh, you know, genetic cause of these. Very much 
Um, these people can present with heart failure or ischemic symptoms. Uh, they can have pre or full sinkhole episodes. Um, and their annual risk is a little less than 1% of sudden cardiac death. But assuredly, that is much higher than the rest of us, uh, especially at uh, this young age. How do we diagnose it? Um, and this is also very, um, it, th this presentation is shared with Dr. Fisher. Please feel free to review it before your boards. Uh, your exam on this is, is classic board fodder. They're going to give you some fancy murmur, um, you know, machinations, and then ask you to, to nail the diagnosis. You're going to have an apical precordial pulse that is laterally displaced. So because they've got so much LVH, their, their precordial pulse is going to move over more towards their uh, um, mid-axillary line. Um, they can have an S4. Um, they can have a paradoxically split S2. Um, uh, they have a harsh systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur at the left upper sternal border that you know, goes down to the left lower sternal border without carotid radiation. And that's the big thing. Because what else is crescendo day, crescendo systolic murmur at the left of the AS. AS. And classically, they're going to give you, well, it radiates to one or both of the carotids, or they'll give you, they additionally have parvus apartus pulse. That's leading you to aortic stenosis. This leads you away uh, from aortic stenosis. Um, your echo is, is the big ones. On, on all my slides, the, the bolded uh, diagnostic step is really where you're going to nail this diagnosis. And you're going to have asymmetric LVH. You may or may not have systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, uh, which can swing out into the LVOT um, because our, our leaflets of the mitral valve are anteromedial and posterior lateral. So your anteromedial in systole is going is to swing out and then you're going to have, that's going to block your LVOT, limiting your, your outflow, uh, therefore limiting um, cardiac output, therefore causing syncope, pre-syncope, ischemia, et cetera. Um, you can have mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation with these. Um, your ECG, there's no real hard and fast specifics, but it's, again, it's getting that 10,000 foot view. The patient's going to tell you what they have. So they can have right or left atrial enlargement from um, backflow and back pressure. Um, they can have inferior Q waves. They have large precordial T wave inversions, which we saw kind of these biphasic T waves here uh, in our precordial leads. Uh, that's not normal for a 37 year old. Um, uh, they can have left axis deviation um, or left anterior fascicular block. They're kind of related for coding. And they can also have a short PR. Now, he had a long PR. Um, and uh, we utilize stress tests to assess gradients. Uh, your gradient is greater than 30 at rest and greater than 50 uh, provoked. Um, we're not going to dive into specifics on that, but if you get these patients, I want you to get an echo and then let that lead you with regards to getting to a cardiologist on whether or not we need to stress these patients. This is a parasternal long axis view um, of uh, a patient with asymmetric septal hypertrophy um, to help you guys in the speed of time. This is the left atrium, mitral valve, named after Bishop's mitre, the tall pointy paths they wear. Um, this is our left ventricle, left ventricular outflow tract, which you can tell we're, we're kind of encroaching on that. Aortic valve, which isn't super well seen here, but you can kind of see a little uh, hyper uh, echogenicity here. Aortic root. If this is the LV, this is the RV, which makes this good. Endoventricular set huge. Also, this is our posterior wall, huge. Um, bonus points. Does anybody know what this structure is? Aorta. Which, perfect. Descending aorta. Good. Because it will wrap up here, kind of come towards us, and then down. So, well done. Um, so this is not normal. Um, we have near full cavity collapse during systole, which is also not normal. So this may come back as 75% EF and 80% EF. Um, and in the question stem, I did not include that this gentleman was an Olympic sprinter or somebody who should have that that output. Um, and on that note with getting into these structural abnormalities, um, there's a kind of a central murmur dogma, if you will, that, that I use. Uh, my, my father taught me this. Murmurs are caused by one of two, two type of ways. Abnormal flow across a normal valve, or what would be the opposite? Good. 
These are the, the just when you think to yourself and you hear that, just think to yourself, okay, is this normal flow across an abnormal valve, people with MVP, people with aortic stenosis, um, those kind of things, or especially in our patients with end stage renal disease who have a fistula, this is a flow murmur, abnormal flow because they're bypassing their capillary bed just across normal valves. Uh, so a, a high output flow murmur. And we see it all the time on peds, but I have to remember that as a resident, that you have febrile patients and patients with anemia with yeah. you know, And you think to yourself, you know, the classic one is your aortic stenosis, your MR, but unless there's a congenital abnormality, do your children have that? No. So think of our other differential, what could be causing this? Um, feel free to take a snapshot of, of this uh, either when you're re-reviewing, but um, this is just walking through. It will also give you your supine to stand maneuver, as well as Valsalva. For hokum with LVOT obstruction, this is going to be what it normally is at baseline. No carotid murmur, uh, normal S1, S4 is common. It's going to be at the apex. When they go from supine to standing, your intensity is going to increase. With Valsalva, it's going to increase. But to stand to squat, it's going to decrease in intensity. Your aortic stenosis murmur is kind of no change with this because this is not a hemodynamically um, variable obstruction. It is what it is. It's a calcific valve. It's always going to be calcific. Um, this is usually going to be at your right upper sternal border, usual positive carotid radiation, and it can actually obscure the S1. Can anybody tell me how I really know aortic stenosis is severe? So it's, so it's more than quiet. It's when it peaks. But on that note, loudness does not tell you whether aortic stenosis is severe or not. That's the classic you know, pimping question. You want to say, oh, if it's six out of six, it must be severe. Um, it's how late it peaks, because aortic stenosis will peak if it takes the entire cardiac length to build up pressure in the LV to finally overcome. Let's go back to that murmur. It's the flow that causes your murmur. So until you have flow across that valve and it opens, you're not going to have a murmur. So, um, and in subvalvular stenosis, I did include this because we, you will see this in, in children. I have never seen it um, in, in my adult medicine. Um, this is more of a fixed defect. Uh, it's, it's a shrieking uh, at the mid uh, uh, left sternal border. Now, if people have seen uh, the most recent uh, Thor, shrieking makes me think of the goats in that. <laughs> Um, and I always laugh when people say that, you know, aortic sclerosis is musical or it shrieks. Or, uh, my ears are good, but they're not that good. <laughs> um, but the big thing is they're going to give you, you know, some, if they're really trying to only get you on murmur, they're going to give you some extra things in your question stem uh, to understand the physiology of, of why that uh, is occurring. And does anybody know why supine to stand increases in intensity? Decreased preload and decreased your after because you're standing up real quick. So therefore, there's less volume in the LV because I've decreased my preload. Therefore, I don't have as large of a chamber. Therefore, the obstruction becomes more because I've not stretched out my ventricle. Whereas when I stand to squat, I'm um, I'm increasing my afterload, increasing back pressure, increasing the time that it's going to take to eject out. So I've got more filling. I move that obstruction out of the way, and therefore I have less abnormal flow across that. Here we go. So um, I'll let you guys move through that. But this is, if you know anything about murmur, probably for your uh, for your um, uh, boards, it would be MR, AS, and, and HOCOM. Those are kind of the classic ones I really want you to... And, this is like your statistics. You either know it or you don't, um, in, in some regards. So if you don't understand the cardiac physiology, this is not going to make sense to you. Management. Uh, first degree relatives uh, should have genetic counseling. Uh, gene testing in the actual um, nidus patient. Um, you're going to have a 12 to 18 month echo plus an uh, ECG in the first degree relatives beginning at 12 to kind of middle aged. Um, you want to treat systolic and diastolic heart failure. Now, this is before the most recent guidelines uh, came out. But your alpha and beta blockers are good. Uh, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, DILT and Grapamil. Others kind of have unclear roles. Um, and obviously, if they have 
Uh, systolic heart failure didn't generally want to avoid the diltiazems, the rapamils, and it's more ACE inhibitors, uh, ARBs, um, your ARNIs, which is your intresto. Um, and now beta blockers have actually taken a back seat. Now all of a sudden we don't think that those necessarily do anything. And those were our bread and butter med. Um, avoid competitive or endurance sports and exercises. Um, treatment treatment is myomectomy, alcohol ablation, which is done by a catheter, um, permanent pacemaker if they have conductive abnormalities. Uh, Mavicamden is the new one on the block. Um, it's, uh, I think, in its phase three or phase four trial. Um, it is a direct cardiac myosin inhibitor. If remember, beta cardiac myosin was one of our causes. It is the first drug on the market that actually treats the root cause of hokum, as opposed to just kind of all put you on some heart failure meds and keep my fingers crossed. So, um, and uh, our main goal is to prevent sudden cardiac death. This is surgical myonectomy. Uh, sorry while you're eating. Uh, but this is a view down from the root uh, through the aortic valve. Uh, this is one leaflet, that's another, and uh, another here. We're cutting out the septum um, and reducing that hypertrophy by literally just removing some muscle. All right. Case number two, 27-year-old male presents with sinkhole episodes in the ER and has a total elevation of 0 0.5, the old ones, um, and his orthostatic blood pressures are negative. On further history taking, he states that he has had multiple presumable episodes in the past while mowing the lawn. Uh, he has no pertinent family history. Vitals are unremarkable. Social history is negative. Justin, have at it. All right, so um, the rate is 75 rhythm. There's a P wave before every QRS complex, you know, upright to the sinus. Um, axis um, is normal axis. And in terms of uh, uh, blocks, there's no first degree block. QR, the QTC looks like it's prolonged um, based off of. So, well, Exactly. It's kind of difficult yeah. to pick a lead. Now, you always want to go by the longest one, but in general, this has got a nice QT, that's got a nice QT. Yeah. Has, does that look A, half the R interval? No. So it's, so it's less than that. Yeah. And if we measure it out, this is 200, about 400. Right. So that, that's normal. And we're not at a faster normal rate, so our QTC should not be yeah, far off from that. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, ischemic stuff. Um, there's inverted T waves in V1 through the five days, I think, four, so like one through three. Good. Um, I'm seeing that with SC segment elevations, and I don't think there's really a depression. Um, Is there any other T wave abnormalities? Oh, sorry, yeah. The. Three and three, yeah. Good. Three and, three. and what is what is that uh, distribution? What region is That's that? Inferior. Good. Yeah. So the two is like yeah, two is not quite good. So does this look like three. a normal EKG to you yeah. for a twenty seven year old? No. Yeah. Okay. He's got pre single symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Now these these uh, T wave inversions are pathognomonic or something. So is there a uh, is there a disease that affects young people causing syncope? with T-wave inversions in the kind of anterior septum and the inferior wall. Well, yes, if this is a yes <laughs> question. <laughs> so yes, there is. Right. No, Kitty, it was, it was leaf, leaf replacement. <laughs> gotcha. Um, yes, there is. Um, so if I tell you that it's affecting the inferior wall and the septum, mm -hmm. in general, what chamber do you think that that's affecting? Uh, is only for right ventricle. Right ventricle, good. Is there a right ventricular cause of syncope in children that is congenital? Again, yes or no question. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have, you heard, have you heard of one of those? I probably should have. Okay. If not, then that's why we do the lecture. Because we, we, we talked about this. 
It is what we talked about last week. Yeah. I actually love it because you guys are so smart. I actually have nothing to teach you. So it's actually <laughs> really nice. So I googled what this. I googled what it was called, and it was just called it, that thing. Epsilon. You were pretty smart. I like the kind of spot on with the Epsilon. Like, no, that's epsilon, epsilon, epsilon waves. Yeah, that's epsilon waves. Cool. That's another. That's just like what it's called. You can see a gradient right? too. So what is the name of this lecture? Congenital arrhythmia. So this is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or dysplasia. So. But this is another good, this is a great example, and I'm obviously, yes, biased, but you can get so much off of this little pink sheet if you know what you're looking at. It literally told us that we had abnormalities in our RV um, because the septum touches both ventricles mm -hmm. plus the inferior walls are usually the RV. Yes, it can technically be left surf territory, but it's it. So this is a fiber fatty deposition within the RV that can also progress into the LV. So it's not just the RV. Mm -hmm. um, it causes a re-entrant ventricular tachycardia with a left bundle morphology um, because it starts in the right, so it ends in the left. Um, and it is autosomal dominant with incomplete penetrance. Usually you are going to have a positive family history. Um, clinically manifests starting very young, 12 to 13 months. Probably old for y'all, but 12, 12, 12 to 13 years of age. That's pretty middle age. <laughs> for, for me, I'm like, for me, with that 12 year old, I'm like, why are you in my office? And I've got to go dig as to why they're in my office. Mean age is uh, is when probably you should start uh, consulting palliative at 30. Uh, so, uh, no. So, geriatric. Um, male, males in generally have a, a more malignant disease course. Um, they can present with palpitations, uh, more so than syncope, more so than atypical chest pain, more so than dyspnea, more so than RV failure. Um, but you know your RV failure can absolutely present like your normal, you know, cardiomyopathies where they've got JVD, fetal edema, or abdominal edema, um, but they're not going to have crackles per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be one of those weird is this uh, carcinoid syndrome kind of uh, diagnosis. Um, Classically, it's going to be our uh, our echo that's going to show RV or LV aneurysms, increased RV thickness. Um, Cathodemonic for you guys is when a young person comes in with an ECG and they have T wave inversions in D1 to D3. That is just, unless they're having a septal ischemic event, which would be unlikely. I'm not, you know, familiar with hypertrichoidemics. They can have that. One of my friends coded at the age of 32 from an LAD in part. So it can happen. You always want to rule out things that'll kill them. But that's just gonna, to your mind's eye, look very strange. Yeah. You're gonna like you caught it. You're like, that's why or why are they having seen you? And then epsilon waves, um, which we will get to here shortly. This is a uh, subcostal view, um, a subxycoid view of the uh, patient's heart, right atrium, RV. This is not normal. Um, it looks like the, the Gungan sub from episode one in Star Wars. Uh, we've got all these bubbles here, um, and we've got all this change in kind of the echogenicity of the RV wall. That just does not look normal to you. LV looks pretty good, um, and considering we just had Hokum, this is a much more closely normal interventricular septal fit, uh, thickness. Um, this is probably grabbing some of the pat muscle, which is why this looks so thick here, but our wall is only about there. Left atrium here. So this does not look normal. Uh, I have the classic arrow sign that uh, immediately allows you to clinically correlate this. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so this is this is and remember for for us now these the parasternal I showed you the subzoid these are views you can grab. Um, I'm not asking you to do velocities across a valve, but you can grab these at bedside. Um, this is our. Uh, oh. oh yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the the beauty, beautiful gold standard. Yes, is MRI, and now that we've got advanced imaging here with Dr. Paulo, we're hiring. Um, I think um, we actually have a, a woman uh, cardiologist coming on next year, which is very exciting. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. We need more of them. We need more of them. Yeah, you uh, them so, all off the line, So huh? we are going to get. Um, she goes to the There's yes. babies everywhere. Ladies there are. are cardiologists everywhere. We are. We are. I think we're actually second only to ortho with regards to. Uh, limited mm -hmm. women disparity in, in our in our uh, like, in our culture, but <laughs> CT and MRIs are becoming more and more available to us in our hospitals. So now, for all I know, especially over at Norton, it's probably really available to do. But MRI is the classic thing that's really going to let you show 
late enhancement with the gadolinium, fiber fatty deposition. So very good call. It's a bigger uh, issue doctor. getting it covered by the insurance. Yeah, yeah, most yeah. of these are going to be your outpatient people, so you yeah. have to go through a lot of prior options. Chris, for that, EKG, is it normal to have low voltage in the interior leads because there's just infiltration of the public air production? Is Can be. Is this is a sign, or is that not at all? This probably would not really be tipped as low voltage per se, uh, because I can't, uh, when I read them, I can't code low voltage in high lateral in two of the three inferior leads. Okay. These meet voltage criteria. But to your point, because we all went debt a quarter million dollars, don't let a machine overread you. Um, this also tells you that something is inhibiting good uh, conduction. Well, what can cause that? Fiber fatty deposition, amyloid, sarcoid, all these, you know, um, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy. So, again, that's a good catch of, of what these can tell you way before you even get the echo. So, that's the echo. Another good example, these are epsilon waves. Um, these I literally will call ditzels. I lightheartedly, you know, told Ryan that he absolutely can do that. Um, looks like the poor guy had PTSD. He's already <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a this is we've got inferior um, T wave inversions. We've got epsilon waves after the QRS, which are just these little schmutz, ditzel, any other fun Yiddish words that you know um, that just don't look right. That's not a bundle branch walk. Um, this is a normal kind of, you know, RS complex, but this catches your eye, and you caught it, uh, which is very, very subtle. Um, but again, these are young patients who should not have T-wave inversions in actual continuous leads. So you're going to realize to your mind's eye it's not normal. What's the physiology? The calico sign. <laughs> the calico sign that's happening there. There's just like breakthrough late conductions and part of the market. So uh, on that note, in all honesty, I, I I did not read up as much as what I should have on that kind of subtlety as the web. And really, there's new evidence that comes up that like STEMI is actually PR or TP depression, but because it go or because it goes off of the TP baseline, that's why the ST looks elevated because of how the calculator does it. And when I was in med school, nobody really cellularly knew why that changes. Yeah, so, sure. um, but it's it's abnormal conduction within that because of uh, fiber fatty deposition. Um, this, just to give you an example, this is a this is stuff this is not good. <laughs> uh, I don't want I don't want Dr. Two to be sitting there going, okay, like no, one fifty. Um, this is a this is VT, this is wide complex regular tachycardia, which is always VT until proven otherwise with a left bundle morphology. We do not have an RSR prime complex in V1. We have an R with a deep S wave. So terminal deflection is away from the right. And then our only deflection, but by extension, our terminal deflection is an R wave going towards V6, which means the last thing to fire is going towards the left. Um, when you look at this, it can be very difficult to kind of line up what's a T, what's an R, etc. Again, remember, this is a football stadium. It's the same football play from different angles. So you find a nice, you know, one that looks, oh, here's my T wave. You just track that down. It all lines up. You now know what the T wave looks like here. You follow it over, and then you track back up. So that, that's a very easy way to find your, your, your R's, S's, and T's when it can look quite frightening when it's sinusoidal like that. So how do we manage these patients? MRI, absolutely, for scar, for scar quantification, it directly correlates to our VT potential. So um, uh, MRI is really what we would love. Um, you want to avoid competitive or endurance sports and exercise. Uh, we can pharmaceutically control it with Sotolol, high-dose MEO. Obviously, these patients, you are going to be co-managing them with your cardiologist. Um, VT ablation is successful, but it's only temporizing. And you do uh, want to look into ICD placement for definitive protection against VT. But ARVD and HOCOM, absolutely no missed stuff. I'm sure you will see it on your boards, um, at least one, uh, you know, if not management questions. Because as, you know, even if you're not going into pediatric cardiology, the MRI, you can give them a heads up. This is what you know, we want to look into, um, getting people to genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera. So. How does the MRI reports? Um, and it's important, I mean, for, for the geriatric med piece patients at 30, I need to know about it as well. So, um, you know, so you actually have a lot of advantage. So I love the areas where 
we might have an advantage over everybody else because that's how you pass your boards, right? When you get more questions. Yep, for sure. Right? So we're going to hopefully slam dunk these on the medicine boards. And you can help the patients Just way before I even get to see them. So if you catch them at 12 or 13, then they can come to me as, no, seriously, it's, it's somebody already caught them. So, um, all right, case number three. Um, this. So I, I believe so because we've not, I don't think we've nailed down every single gene that causes ARVD um, and, and there's a smattering of stuff. Yes, I, I didn't really touch on that, but. Um, I, I believe all of these, especially for the first, uh, for your periodized patient, but for your, um, because it's autosomal dominant, you're gonna want your first three relatives uh, to at least be a heads up, you know, you may want to do genetic testing um, yeah, absolutely. 47-year-old um, male presents to emergency department with chief complaint of um, shortness of breath. Um, shortness of breath. Um, yeah, see if you could fit that. I like so good. With shortness of breath. Uh, further, further history is positive for orthopnea, dyspnea on exertion, reduced exercise tolerance, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Patient has a BNP of 900, has plus two pitting edema bilaterally to his shins. Family history is pertinent for a mother with, quote, heart problems. Vital signs are pertinent for 94% on three liters native cannula. Social history is negative. So what do I think the patient in general has diagnosed? Heart failure. Heart failure. Heart failure. Good. Um, and is pretty young, yeah. is not smoked, doesn't really have an a overtly robust family history. So I'm thinking ischemic is less likely, even though that's the most likely cardiomyopathy. Um so rate is roughly um uh, ninety so um it's it eighty two, but I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it is a let's see we have you get a few other profiles you have to like you know, maybe get a touch of first to close to first degree and all normal, normal. Well, I can let's, really let's, let's, let's find a, a QRS that starts on, yeah, on a bold bit. line. Let me strip here. It's like, here. This, oh, oh. So this one starts right here on a big pink line. Yeah. So it's like a little long, long. So it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, when you say a pretty good P wave, what's the P wave look like to you? So it's, it's upright at least, but this one's kind of got a two. Uh, it's it's kind of really got this like double hump, so it's kind of like maybe a large, it could be a sign of a large. But, uh, and it's not, it's not kind of got two humps, it's got two humps. You're absolutely right. So it's five phasic, but which component, which the component, which component is a little bit, I'm sorry, the left side of the is a little bit larger, so it looks like the left each of Wonderful. So this is, this is, what is this called then? Well, but what's, what's what the Latin, Latin words, Latin phrases? Uh, Sinister no. something. Uh, Sinister. So if it's the left atrium, what valve does the left atrium then pass through? The and if we're talking about P waves, it is a P mitrally. Good. So, a P mitrally. The other one is a palm? Uh, palm uh, absolutely. <laughs> which throws you for a loop because it's not a good tricuspid alley. Anyways. The um, so good. is wide. As good. Well, um, and it looks like it's left deflecting on the left. So I would say it's a left bundle good. Uh, pattern. And then you have sort of that normal ST segment and T ones, which could just be a function. Well, you you already had the lecture last week, so I'm going to ask you to double down. Is it normal? I would say it's expected, but I would call it as more of a secondary cause of the LV. LV Perfect. Yeah. It's physiologic discordance. Yeah. Good. Because um, you will get called on this. Yes. <laughs> Other than that, um, got PVC in there. Fun. Where's it coming from? I'm uh, kidding. You know, like, <laughs> you still do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most positive and guess scenario. That's, so. that's fun. That maybe. Um, let's see. Other than that, there is some, like, you know, we talk about ST segment deviation, like the material, or the picorial weeds, um, but it's kind of all the way. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of throughout, and this yeah. is this is concave. Yeah, this patient is presenting to you with new heart failure, so you do want to rule out that this is not a new left bundle yeah. uh, causing this. Uh, and last but not least, it does have a let's see, it's not left axis deviation, but it's got a little bit. So I would actually argue that it is. So one and two are completely positive. Mm -hmm. This is a tricky one. Now is two positive? Yes. 
But three and ADF, ADF are also negative. negative. Yeah, I guess I use two as the tiebreaker because if it's isoelectric, it's 90 degrees from the LED cutoff. Okay, so yeah, so if you use your perpendicular, that. Uh, so then I put them like above zero, but not at negative yeah. 30, yeah. if you will. I, I, I would ask you to at least call this borderline. <laughs> yeah. I realize that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but if I had like, put a number, I guess that's like negative 20, negative 18 on it or something like okay. that. Gotcha. Yeah. I would think overall. This is this is a like most left picture. funnel branch blocks are going to be left axis deviation. Yeah, yeah. It's so. a picture too, because okay. well, probably and yeah, maybe so it's pretty pretty the reflections over there too. So probably I would be thinking about some LDH. Uh, possibly because this S wave is so yeah. deep. Yes, good. Um, does not probably meet LDH criteria because these are less than ten uh, millivolts, so it doesn't get above this this second large big box. So much like we did with ARVD, we've got what type of bundle branch block? left, which is in what chamber? LV. We've got a patient who doesn't smoke, um, overall has very limited risk factors for ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, he's in a heart failure exacerbation. Um, amyloid. What, so amyloid would be on your list, yes. Um, but it's, it's young, so do young people usually get amyloid. Maybe a special genetic kind. For sure. <laughs> super, super. But no, but is there a special genetic kind of LV cardiomyopathy? Probably, there it seems to be yes. And feel, yes. feel free to phone uh, a friend back there. Non compaction, <laughs> so good. Oh. Yeah. So we have non compaction cardiomyopathy. There is uh, there's actually a lovely patient yeah. that I believe he's doing well at the VA. This was my first uh, exposure to this. Um, and I was on a rotation with Dr. Deep Lippis, and I was reading through my echo. This is another big, big important thing of read through the entire echo report, not just the interpretation summary. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, sometimes you cardiologists leave important things out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it just But that it said that there were LV apical trabeculations. And I, I was just kind of reading through it, da 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 da, da EFs, you know, 52 percent and it was like LV apical you know, trabeculations, thinking it was like just uh, yeah, like somebody, somebody's, somebody's over calling this. Dr. D. Flippis goes, hold up. Like, wait, wait a minute here, you know? <laughs> and he goes, it has what? And I said, he goes, yeah, this is non-compaction. <laughs> so um, this is a failure of compaction, hence the name, uh, during endomyocardial morphogenesis. Um, there are loads of chromosomal abnormalities that can cause this. In general, it is autosomal dominant, but rarely it can be X-linked. Um, and a sarcomeric gene is the most common. Uh, it's about a third of the cases. They will present with heart failure symptoms, pre or full syncope, palpitations. Their echo is the big one that's going to show LV uh, apical trabeculations. And their ECG is going to be normal, plus minus some left bundle, you know, uh, 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 conduction abnormalities, PVCs. This one is going away from ABR, away from ADL, uh, towards ABF, uh, towards V1, and um, uh, towards the tube. This is probably left ventricular outflow tract near the base of the heart. If you guys get into this, the only thing you do with PVCs is you get a 12 lead rhythm and you do it like you would axis. And you just kind of make 12 vectors and build it from there. That's how you do that. But regardless, it's telling you that it's coming from the left side. Um, and our MRI is another big um, uh, helpful uh, scan on these patients. Uh, also confirms the calculations. But it gives a much clearer image than the echo. Um, you know, half your patients with uh, heart failure either have portal effusions or maybe a small pericardial effusion or larger body habitus. Uh, they have OSA, so they've got larger lung windows. So it can be difficult to really get a good view uh, of, the, of that LV. Do I remember, do they have a biopsy these two? Or is it the, is it the uh, we biopsy ARBD. Um, we don't, I think, usually biopsy, it, but we can because. I remember it like, seeing like some path with like trabeculation. Yeah, because you can you can prove that there's yeah. actual non protection. Um, I've not had a ton of these patients to tell you that we biopsy every single one of them, but these are the trabeculations. So this is an apical four chamber. We have huge LV enlargement. LV is supposed to be larger than RV, but not this much larger. Um, and it's kind of a foreshortened view. That's why the left atrium is so tiny. Um, but these little finger-like projections out into the LV um, is the relief image of the trabeculations into the LV uh, apical wall. And then you get much, uh, much clearer, you know, kind of um, linear um, signs here on, on MRI. So 
manage these generally just the same you would for any other non -esteem. There's no real special, you know, meds we give. Um, ICD placement, uh, especially if they meet criteria otherwise. Um, now, if they have a 45% EF, but they've had VT, uh, et cetera, then that would tip them more into a, a secondary prevention ICD. Um, and the, the special meds really is this, because people understandably said, well, they've got all these trabeculations, are they at a higher risk for blood clots? Uh, if you make, if that trabeculation causes then an aneurysm or, you know, um, dyskinesis of the apex, am I going to get blood clots? There's no real clear consensus. And in general, currently, you put them on a blood thinner if they have another reason for it. DVT-PE times 2, um, they've got AFib, uh, those kind of things, then absolutely. Now, I don't think you're ever going to be, like, wrong, but if this is a 30-year-old with healthy non you can just slap them on, on anticoagulation for life. And the, and the flip side of that is, do I want to risk my 35-year-old getting a stroke? Yeah. So this is this is another good example of good discussion with your patients directly over what do we think is best for you. Um, so, production diseases. 32-year-old male presents to the ER with general malaise, intermittent fever, productive cough for the last three days. Denies chest pain palpitations or syncope. Notably, his four- and six-year-old children were recently ill with similar symptoms that previous week. They both go to the same daycare, have a Past medical history is unremarkable. Vital signs are stable. Temps 99.8. Social history negative. <clears throat> In the interest of time, we've got a normal axis. One and two are positive. We've got sinus uh, sinus uh, rhythm. Um, we've got this would be a, a surely long normal PR, probably right at 200, maybe 205. Um, we've got a narrow QRS. We have, um, so no bundle branch block, our QT looks normal. Um, signs of ischemia, our axial leads uh, look good. Uh, we do have a flat T wave in three. If it is isolated, that's okay. The isolated Q wave in three is allowed, as long as it's the only lead that's in there, i.e. two and ABF look normal. But it is Shark Week uh, on Discovery Channel. So uh, these are ST elevations, but they don't look like our normal ST elevations. They're not our classic tombstones, if you will. If anything, I might say that you know, you're know you going out to Vail or uh, Breckenridge, and those are down-sloping ST elevations in V1 and V2. What area is V1 and V2? Septum. Good. This is a young patient, 32, who's got, what is his general prodrome? This is a... Viral prodrome, has never had a reason to get out of an EKG, has effectively no symptoms from a cardiopulmonary standpoint, but we catch this. What is this? And instead of veil, let me tell you that he's actually skiing in the Alps. I love it. Swiss. Swiss. My awful humor. Swiss. Swiss, but where are the Alps also? It's not just Switzerland. They just Italy. have the best fans. Italy, good. What are we we're right there. We're knocking on the door. What are we you, <laughs> you know the name. <laughs> it's what? Yeah. It's not nonsense. This will kill you. <laughs> so this is Brugada pattern and syndrome. This patient is presenting with Brugada pattern because he is not presented with syncope and or BTBF. Um, and this, this stem is actually, my dad was 20 years in the practice and this was the first Brugada he had. Uh, came in with this stem. Uh, young patient had never had a reason to get an EKG otherwise. Um, the ER appropriately calls it. Ah, you just come down here. Look at this. Um, this is a sodium channelopathy. Do remember that. That could be on your boards. They're not going to ask you the gene, but it is a sodium channelopathy that is septal focused. Um, if they're asymptomatic, it's pattern. Symptomatic is syndrome. Um, non sustained VT is pattern. Sustained VT is syndrome. Um, it's 2 to 9 um, to 1 in males, so male predominant, autosomal dominant, um, and uh, mean age is about 40 years uh, old. Um, tenfold increase in patients with schizophrenia compared to no schizophrenia. And I, they, I don't think they know the etiology of this. And I don't think it's necessarily from a pharmaceutical cause, because this is a genetic cause, per se. Um, now, to your point... Yes. Or like they just have four like, presentation, incidental finding versus sudden cardiac death, sustained VT. 
diagnosis. So, so there's no viral program association. Like no viral program exacerbating. Yeah. Not well. Was, so it could, in the sense of promoting electrolyte abnormalities, uh, hypovolemia, ischemia, etc. But if you got this EKG on the same person like a week before you had the viral, program, he would. He could. Same thing. He could yeah, still have that. But sometimes these viral programs will also exacerbate okay. your channel opti and seeing it on EKG. Um, so so like having is, having an old EKG that was normal doesn't preclude this from being. Uh, correct. Okay. Correct. Once you see that EKG, it yeah, you okay. they got yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, echo usually normal. Structural heart disease not associated with Brugada. Um ECG classically downsloping mm -hmm. or saddleback ST elevation B one and B two. That will be your stem on your boards. They're not going to give it to you B three B four. Um, drug challenge uh, sometimes with sodium channel blockers in select patients um, in genetic testing in the syndrome, but not the pattern. Um, Type 1 versus type 2, I will let you guys read more about this. Type 1 is usually what you're going to get on boards because it's the one that we all know. There's actually three types, if I'm not mistaken, of um, this three, as you could guess, is a mix of 1 and 2. The saddleback, though, for all of us that are not taking cards boards, is way too picky to get you to a non-ischemic channelopathy as your diagnosis. You're going to appropriately say, rule out seven, like activate the cap. <laughs> <laughs> Management. This is long, but this is your flow chart to kind of figure out, do I need to put in, you know, an ICD? Do we need to, you know, do anything else? Um, but I will let you review that on your own. Um, ICD for the algorithm. Antiarrhythmic. Um, the sodium channel blockers, that's a test for these patients. We don't leave them on it. So don't have them on flecainide or picanamide. Um, AMIO is probably going to be your bread and butter that you're going to normally expect to see your patients on. I've never seen anybody on quinidine. Um, ablative therapy in patients with an ICD who have recurrent shocks but they've failed pharmacologic therapy, uh, we can try to go VT ablate them. Um, avoid sodium blocking psychotropic drugs, to your point, lithium, TCAs, oxycarbazepine. There's actually a wonderful just website for this, drugs.org, to kind of make sure that your patients are on safe, safe stuff. Case number five, 21 year old male presents to your office to establish PCP. Review systems is negative outside of palpitations intermittently with rare accompanying lightheadedness. They have no pertinent uh, past medical history or family history of sudden cardiac death. Bio signs are good. Social history is pertinent for heavy caffeine use with coffee and bad energy drinks. Occasionally use a vape pen. Um, I cannot tell you guys, I always forgot it as a resident. I did a lot even as a, a fellow, but now that I really want to go into EP, I'm starting to remember it. Ask about packing use. You guys might already be really good at that with your med feeds patients, but especially for chest pain, palpitation, syncope, and the use of pre-workout and all the stuff that we've got now, ask this. I would argue do it for all your hospitalized patients because caffeine withdrawal is a common cause of headaches in the mm -hmm. hospital, and you can give somebody some Duracet or an extra cup of coffee and prevent them workup and other medications that you might have to use. Very good point. So this, is, this should just be included now because this is the most heavily abused drug in the world. So, to get uh, together, uh, our axis is what? Positive well, one. Normal. 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 Good. Um, are we irregular or regular? We're irregular. Irregular. Good. Um, our rate is fast or slow or normal? Normal. On average. Normal. On normal. normal. Um, let's do our intervals. Uh, is our PR normal? No, it's a little short. Good. Is our QRS normal? No. No. A little long. Uh, is our QT normal? No. So it's probably at 450. It's probably okay. Um, good. Uh, our wave progression is. A little late, I would agree. B5, probably B6 is actually the tallest. Um, and you said the QRS is wide, so what kind of bundle branch block do we have? Good, left bundle, good. Do I expect a left bundle in a healthy 21-year-old male? No. Um, and I already told you about hope, I'm saying, no, it's not going to be hope. Hope <laughs> it's, it's conduction. It's, not it's conduction, good. good. That's the <laughs> now, yes. Sign of the signs of ischemia, uh, this is probably, um, uh, Physiologic uh, discordance, a little depression of the ST, a little abnormality of the T wave. Um, this is isolated. Oh, we've got it here, so that's a little abnormal. 
this is some physiological discordance. Now, um, pathognomonic findings. I already told you, I told you guys last week to save those for the end. Anything here that you see for somebody who would have lightheadedness and it does like absolutely. He says very banally or however you adverbify that word. So we have a delta wave, good, which means we probably don't have a bundle branch plot per se. But we've got this short PR and this, you know, we're going sailing. Uh, we've got this nice delta wave here um, that feeds right into the QRS. So what is this diagnosis? What is this patient? Have? More broadly, they have. More specifically than that, <laughs> there's a middle ground. I, I'm telling you this in case you get it on because they're not. They don't won't always Some give you WPW. Topic reentry. Uh, re yeah. Good. Yeah. So the reentry tachycardia. He's not tachycardic here. Where does it reenter between? Not at the node, which means it's not AV NRT. It's AV RT. So AV RT is the broad umbrella term for that Wolf Parkinson's white is included within. So it has a distinct accessory pathway in addition to our normal pathway. Um, our AV pathways otherwise are normal. A premature beat, atrial, junctional, or ventricular, can trigger re-entry through this accessory pathway. Because what does the accessory pathway not have? A node. There's no compensatory cause. There's nobody telling them, you know, sorry, school children are leaving the school. We have to stop here. Um, <laughs> presentation. Pre and full syncope, palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, dyspnea of exertion. Echoes, usually normal. ECG classically has a short PR, a bundle branch morphology, delta waves, and tachycardia. You can have orthodromic and antidromic. You will most likely not be asked this, but orthodromic is much more common. It's going to have a narrow complex PRS, no delta wave because antigrade conduction, normal conduction, is through our AV his pathway, which has our compensatory pause, which means our PR is normal, and I don't have this slurry. Retrograde conduction, though, is through the accessory pathway. So they can have a ventricular rate between 150 and 250. Antidromic is relatively rare, albeit it's what you're going to be tested on, because it gives you that wide complex QRS, the delta wave. Why do we have delta wave? Because our antigrade conduction is through the accessory pathway. We have no pause which means our PR looks abnormal. Um, our retrograde conduction is then through the normal AV disc path, same ventricular rate. For our orthodromic management, vagal maneuvers, AV uh, blocking, uh, uh, IV therapy, adenosine, parathenol, beta blockers, those work. Why? Because the normal flow down that's propagating this is through the AV node. So if I give them an AV node medication, we're good to go. We slow them down. You can do radio frequency ablation for symptomatic patients, in particular people like athletes, truck drivers, pilots, uh, patients that are in special groups. Um, I don't want my pilot passing out. Um, in fact, the worst question I had on ABIM, I think it was ABIM, it was step uh, three, was an airline pilot with an asymptomatic second degree Mobitz one. Now normally we don't do anything to those patients, and I believe that was the right answer, that's what I clicked, but they're going to tell you, oh, by the way, they've got 250 souls with them on board. <laughs> are you going to give them a pacemaker? <laughs> yeah, they will need a chance. Exactly, that was the, that was the, no. Um, but I still, also, you may be fine. Yes, so I still maintain that people who write these exams most likely were not going to Um uh, They just ask all the questions. Um, you, we can also do surgical ablation, and then pharmacologic therapy, uh, class 1C antiarrhythmics, glepinide, propathenone, beta blockers, or second line. I thought we weren't supposed to give adenosine So this is orthodromic. This is going through the AV node. But if we block the AV node, can you precipitate it down? No, no, because that pathway is only taking it up. That's how they're, that's how they're circuit is. So, to my knowledge, those pathways are much less likely to be, if you will, bipolar and be able to take signals either way. Um, because you're absolutely right, antidromic, the ones that you see on your test, which they're trying to trick yeah. you into doing an AV node blocker, right. is when you don't want to do it. Okay. So you still are hitting the nail on the head. Because um, we did that. And it ended poorly. Yes. Uh, so I, 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 I applaud it myself in creating a safe <laughs> space to <laughs> feel you can tell me that. It must have been my face there. We precipitated a delta wave. Yes. And then we're like, we should chop this video. Yes. Yeah. And we did.
So um, antidromic um, ablations, um, your your plaquenide and your but we want to avoid those aminotal blocking agents um, because then you just send them into um, only sending them into their accessory pathway that's going to be integrated through that. So last but not least, 25-year-old female uh, presents uh, to you she complained of chronic fatigue and rare syncope. They moved out of state with a uh, prior PCP ruled out thyroid and symptomatic anemia as causes. Thorough review systems pertinently positive for a single pass simple episode with a seizure. Um, vital signs are unremarkable social history is negative. What is abnormal on the CTG? Long QT. Good. So congenital long QT. Um, one in 2,000 live births, possibly one in 1,000 for, for just genotypic without phenotypic pen penetrance. Because um, the penetrance is only about 10 to 25%. So by that, it can be more common than what we get credit for. High penetrance in the Dravel and Lang Nielsen forms, uh, as well as other rare infantile forms. Usually, they're going to present under 30 years of age. The average age at Mayo Clinic is 12 years of age. Um, majority of them are going to be asymptomatic for their entire life. However, and commonly, what we want to avoid is sudden cardiac death. Uh, otherwise, they may present with syncope or syncope with seizures. Um, in general, your QTC is going to be greater than 440. Um, it may be a typo because that's quite low. Um, we want to avoid polymorphic BT or torsade plant, which is, um, I saw that uh, once when I was a med student. Um, she self converted out of it, but did go into the torsades. Um, and they also can also uh, be sinus created cardio. That's another good point. Again, let me bring back what Dr. Bishop said. Hand measure your QT so you don't miss this kind of stuff. The short score is actually on uh, MedCal. Uh, so you can, you can add that to your library of calculators. That lets you know that there's a low, medium, or high risk of long QT syndrome. Um, when you measure it, beginning of the QRS to the end of the T, do not include U waves unless the U wave is actually part of the T. Um, V2 and V3 are particularly useful because that's where QT is usually the longest. And this is not a, like, it's 4.50 on a Friday, I don't want to worry about this, I'll just take it from, from one at ADL because it's fine there. But, but V2 and V3 are long. You, you look across the entire ECG and you find whatever is the longest and you take that as your measurement. Um, take, really want to take a detailed history sports, noises, emotion, even things with sleep, because there are different types of congenital long QT that all have different predisposing factors. So what you don't want to happen. <laughs> so um, as you can tell, this vector is an R and an S, and these are just R, so that's kind of twisting of the point, so it's uh, polymorphic VT. That's the other buzzword, polymorphic VT, if they don't give you torsade de on your boards. That's the, the question, or that's the answer, it's polymorphic. Management. You want to limit exercise more specifically in long QT1. There's high risk of events in long QT3 during sleep. And there are specific mutation recommendation, recommendations that in the interest of this lecture, I'm not going to dive deeply into. Um, initial pharmacologic therapy, beta blockers reduce both sudden cardiac death and syncope. Propranolol and natalol, though, are preferred, so it's more of our non-selective beta blockers. Um, metoprolol, oddly enough, has uh, significantly more breakthrough events. You do want to put a device in for select patients, especially if they presented with sudden cardiac arrest or death. Um, and a special note on your postpartum patients. Uh, there's an increased risk of cardiac events in the first six to nine months after birth, especially with long QT2 mutation, beta blockers in those patients are protected. UpToDate has a really, really good article that, probably multiple articles that I was reading that dives into all the nuance of this, but it's it's much longer than just, oh, I gave too much show um, So essentially you treat them the same on just the presentations. Correct, but there's some, some subtle, you know, as opposed to our usual just metoprolol, carbetalols, you want to know that they want non-selective. Note on exercises, this chart you guys can read through, um, but depending on the subtype, if they've had symptoms, do they have a device, kind of allows you to pick what type of sports are they allowed. Um, and, you know, class 1A sports, bowling, cricket, curling, golf, riflery, yoga, it kills me that cricket is included with yoga. Yeah, that's <laughs> that, you know, that uh, no. Uh, I mean, if, we, if you guys watched the T20 World Cup last year, I mean, those... Yeah. Players are, are working. Like, 
This is not vinyasa yoga that we're doing. Um, and then higher level of sports, uh, such as I believe it was a Danish soccer player. Yeah, I don't know if he had long QT, uh, but Christian Eriksen, I mean, yeah, but Christian Eriksen had to have like this special clause within the contract to get back on the pitch with a device because he had sudden cardiac death. Um, some more science kind of stuff, but um, thank you guys for oh, good, it's only one good. thank you for sitting uh, longer a little bit. Um, you know, it's one thing, it's not not too bad. Those last ones were kind of fast, but um, those are all good things to just keep in your back of your mind. A lot of them for you guys are known as diagnoses. Just at the very end, when you read the EKG, just make sure you're not missing those. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. <laughs>